battle scar from the comforted to those who grieve from the mountain top to the empty cup from the waiting to those who have received we cry out as one we still Yeah.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship in Ballycastle Presbyterian Church today. As you can see, our doors remain closed, but I want to welcome you to worship, for you to open the doors of your heart and enter in to worshiping God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And as we do so, we join with the congregations also of Croakmore and Tober Key, and those who join with us on our websites from much further afield, you are really welcome to worship here today. Today is the uh, third Sunday in Lent, the 7th of March, and in preparation for today, I read these words from Psalm 122, which says, I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. Folks, you're really welcome to worship alongside us here today. And as we approach God to sing uh, from the bottom of our hearts, here is love vast as the ocean. Let us just bow our heads first in prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and we rejoice in your goodness to each and every single one of us. And we pray, Lord God, as we turn to worship you, that you would assist us by your Spirit to worship you in spirit and in truth. And so come, Holy Spirit, come and lead us in our praise to bring glory to the Father through Christ the Son. Amen. love vast as the ocean loving kindness as the flood when the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood who is love will not remember who can see Throughout his eternal days On the mount of crucifixion Fountains open deep and wide Through the flood gates of God's mercy Let us pray. 
Father, as we come to worship you this day, we thank you for the example that you have shown to us in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the model we see in him of faithful service. And we thank you for the dedication he showed throughout his ministry and the example that he set, the fact that he was not prepared to cut any corners or to take the easy path, but rather confront injustice and evil within our word, our world head to head and even face to face. So Father, we come here today to confess our uh, inability to follow his example, that we uh, often turn a blind eye to what we know to be wrong, even bending the rules for ourselves. We go along with the crowd rather than face being thought of different or to stand out in the name of Jesus. We close our eyes and our ears to what we would rather not think about. We make excuses for and seek to justify our faults. We give way to temptation, promising next time it will be very different. We wash our hands of difficult decisions, claiming it is none of our business. And so forgive us. Forgive us those times when we have failed to speak up for what is right, when we have colluded and wrong, when we have lost sight of both. And so we cry out to you, Lord God, to renew us by your Spirit, to restore us through your love, and in your mercy equip us through your power, the power of the Holy Spirit, and so enable us to stand for up for what is right, to stand in Jesus' footprints in this day, and to live for him. And so, Lord God, as we turn to your word now, we ask that you would open the ears of our hearts to what you want to say to us this day, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Can I encourage you to turn to our first reading today, which is from John chapter 2, verses 13 to 21. And this passage is entitled where uh, Jesus clears the temple court. Let us hear the word of God. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables, exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. Amen and thanks be to God for his holy and inspired word. Now, if you were watching the midweek uh, last Wednesday, you'll see the launch of a new initiative by our denomination entitled Sinking. And we're going to watch a short video now of our moderator, the Reverend Dr. David Bruce, explain what that's all about. And I'm going to invite you and encourage you to come on board with this new initiative entitled Sinking. Afterwards, we're going to again watch a short video, again following the life of Moses and the people of God, uh, as they escape from Egypt through the Red Sea. And then we're going to worship 
before we come to God's word with uh, the beautiful hymn, Are You Washed in the Blood? These have been deeply difficult times for everyone. Right across Ireland, as indeed throughout the world, people are asking serious questions to guide us through. Many people are fearful and anxious and have been for months. Confronted by death, many others are asking the deepest questions of all. Why am I here? What does it all mean? It's as if, like a boat, we've been cast adrift from our moorings and left to the mercy of the elements. Where can I find safety in such an emergency? So I want to introduce a great little video which speaks into this moment. It's called Sinking, and it's for everyone. In a very gentle but hopeful way, this video shows that our faith in God makes the big difference at a time of uncertainty. It takes the biblical picture of an anchor as showing the security we can have in Christ at a time when nothing else seems to add up. At a time when many people are feeling fed up and even sinking under the pressure of all that has happened to us, this is a very simple way to get a conversation going about faith and life and meaning. So you can use this little three minute video by yourself. You can post it on your social media feeds or better still, you could send it as a direct message to a friend. Congregations could plan an outreach service around it and invite people who don't normally come to church to log on for a look. It's designed to be used flexibly. And of course, it's completely free. So it's over to you. The video will be available for download from today on the PCI website. So go for it and be a blessing to those around you. The final plague had the Egyptians scared, and they urged the Israelites to leave quickly. The Hebrews gathered their belongings and livestock and left Egypt with great rejoicing. To make their departure even sweeter, as this massive sea of men, women, children, and flocks and herds of livestock made their way out of Egypt, the Egyptians loaded them down with incredible treasure. Their centuries of slavery had come to an end. God delivered his people just as he had promised. God led the Israelites out into the desert wilderness. While on their journey, God cared for his people. To help them find their way, he led them in the daytime as a pillar of cloud. During the night, he appeared as a pillar of fire. These columns not only gave the Israelites direction, but also comfort. The pillar of cloud protected them from the harsh rays of the sun, and the pillar of fire kept them warm through the cold desert nights. After the Hebrews left, Pharaoh changed his mind and said, What have we done? We let the Israelites go and have lost their services. Pharaoh commanded that his chariot be made ready, and he summoned more than 600 of his best chariots and officers. As he and his charioteers rode off, Pharaoh's entire army marched behind him. All of Egypt's military was in pursuit of the Israelites. As Pharaoh's armies got near, the Israelites caught sight of them and began to panic. They quickly turned on Moses and asked him, why did you bring us out of Egypt to die in the desert? But Moses stood firm and called upon his fellow Israelites to do the same. Fear not, and see the salvation the Lord will bring you today. You will never see these Egyptians again, for the Lord shall fight for you. Moses stretched his hand over the sea and the Lord sent a strong wind that drove back the waters until they were parted, leaving a dry path straight through the middle. All the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea, walking on dry land with towering walls of water on both sides. 
After the Israelites had made some way through, Pharaoh's entire army followed them on the path the Lord had made through the middle of the sea. When Pharaoh's army had made it midway through the sea, the Lord threw the Egyptians into confusion and panic. Their chariot wheels, clogged with mud, fell off or got stuck. The Egyptians began to cry out in terror, Let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord fights for them and against us. Once all the Israelites had made it across safely, the Lord had Moses stretch his hand out across the sea again, and walls of water collapsed, crashing down in huge waves upon the Egyptians. Not a single Egyptian who went into the sea survived. After this mighty display of the Lord's power, the Israelites trusted him and Moses as his servant. God had freed them from slavery and from the attacking Egyptian army. Overjoyed, Moses and all the people of Israel began to sing praises to the Lord. The people sang, I will sing my heart out to God. What a victory! He has thrown horse and rider into the sea. God is my strength. God is my song. God is my salvation. I will praise him always. Through this mighty act of deliverance, God set the Israelites free. The Lord would be their God, and they would be his people. Stay with
back everyone. Uh, can I ask you or encourage you to grab your Bibles and turn with me to our second reading here today, which is from Psalm uh, 19. And we're going to read this entire psalm. So let us hear the word of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circle to another. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, in keeping them there is great reward, but who can discern their errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And Lord God, as we turn to these words, may your word uh, fill our hearts and may our thoughts and our words be pleasing to you, our great God, our Lord, our Redeemer, our Rock. Amen. Turn with me to that passage from John chapter 2, from verse 13 through to 21. It's the run-up to the biggest festival in the Jewish calendar. It's Passover, where the people of God gather to remember and celebrate how God saved his people from slavery and tyranny of oppression. How God had intervened and commanded the whole community to take a lamb without blemish, one for each household, slaughter it at twilight and daub its blood on the lentil and doorposts of their homes. Each family was to enter into their home and lock the door, roast what remained of the lamb and eat it. Eat it all and remain there until morning under the safety of the blood of the lamb. Whilst the Lord would pass through Egypt bringing judgment on every firstborn male who was not found under the blood of the lamb. It is into the midst of this scene of festival preparation that Jesus enters the temple in Jerusalem to commence his ministry in John's gospel. And what he sees breaks his heart. It angers him, for before him he sees quite literally a, a cattle market in progress, people selling oxen, sheep and doves at, for exorbitant prices, and the temple bankers sitting behind their tables, overcharging pilgrims, many of whom who had saved all their life for this day to celebrate the Passover just once at the temple of God. And there these men sat, fat, arguing with those who simply wanted to come and worship God, gloating 
counting their takings from these naive people of God. 1 Peter 4 and 17 tells us that judgment begins with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the good news story of God's Son who lay down his life for the sins of the world? It's on the eve of this Passover celebration that the true Lamb of God enters the temple of God and observes all that is before him. Judgment begins at the house of God. And it's a paradox that we now go to the Old Testament to find where true worship of God takes place and to understand how judgment begins at the house of God. For as Jesus, the true Lamb of God, laid down his life for the sins of the world, the temple of God in Jerusalem is no longer God's dwelling place. And neither for that matter is Bally Castle Presbyterian Church, nor Crookmore or even Tobergi, or any man-made structure. The book of Psalms is, of course, one of the five wisdom books of the Bible. Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs are the other four. The Old Testament writings also contain many prophetic utterances from God, of which I believe Psalm 19, which is before us here today, is one which will help us understand something of the judgment of God and how and why it begins at the true temple of God, our hearts. So turn with me, please, to Psalm 19. Psalm 19 can be divided into three sections. The first is verses 1 to 6, where we're told God reveals himself and creation. Something uh, theology teachers call general revelation. Every day, things that God reveals himself uh, to you and me in. I'll give you an example from just this week. Believe it or not, on Monday, John decided to do a spot of gardening. And in the throes of trying to tidy up a hedge at the month, I discovered it was being strangled by ivy. And in the moments that followed, I sensed that God was speaking to me through what I was doing and what I was seeing. And he was saying to me, John, this is what sin does in your life. It quite literally sucks the life out of you. It strangles you so that there is no room for you to breathe. And so what God was saying to me was, you need to get rid of the sin that so easily entangles you. And then you'll have freedom to worship me in spirit and in truth. God's splendor is written not uh, is written in the DNA of creation. It's the work of his hands. The heavens above are constantly rehearsing the glory of God. Only last week, if you'd stepped out of your back door and noticed the moon, it, it was, I think it was entitled a, a snow moon. It was something to behold and it spoke of it was pouring forth speech night after night, something of the glory and the knowledge of God. It's where the psalmist declares that God has pitched his tent for the sun. If you want to see something of the revelation of God all around you, then God has placed you in the right place to see and witness it here in North Antrim. You just need to open your eyes, open your ears and your heart and allow him to speak to you. But one warning here, do not worship the created creation. Worship God, the creator of it all. Secondly, verses 7 through to 11 of verse 19, God reveals himself to us in the scriptures. Do you see this book, the book that you have in your possession right now? It, it has the power to speak life into your life with the help of the Spirit of God. It's all about the Word, and Jesus is the Word incarnate. It's all about the Word 
and the Spirit working in harmony together for the glory of the Father. What does God's word say to us here? Well, it says it's perfect. It revives the soul. God's word is trustworthy, making wise the simple. And boys and dear, do I need that, Lord? God's word, words are right, giving joy to our hearts. His commands are radiant, giving light to our eyes. And here is a very significant verse. Verse 9, which is easy for us to miss and what I believe is the key verse in understanding who we are before God and where our hearts stand and where the temple of God is and where God wants to set up his temple. And the key to receiving God's blessing. In verse 9 it says, The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. I believe as the Spirit helps us see God for who he truly is, high and holy and lifted up, the only one to be revered, then God will reveal to us how awesome his ways are. His words, his laws, his precepts and commands are true and perfect. Rather than being like an analogy of sin being like the ivy, strangling the life out of us, the word of God, his ways, his precepts, his commands bring life and freedom in Christ. Look on with me. God's ways in verse 9 uh, and following are sure, are altogether righteous, more precious than gold, more than the purest, best refined gold. It's sweeter than honey straight from the comb. And by God's word, our hearts are protected and shielded. How? By keeping God's word, his commands, his way stored up in our hearts. By keeping his word there, there is great reward. This is what I need. This is what we all need. This is what the world needs. A desire in our hearts, a thirst in our souls for the word of God. Our hearts to open, to be open and receptive to what God longs to say to us one on one. That his spirit may reveal these things in our hearts and outwork them in our daily lives. And so in verses 1 to 6, we're told that God reveals himself in creation. In verses 7 to 11, God reveals himself to us through his word. And finally, God reveals himself to us in our hearts as we worship him. Let me say that again for this is where God's temple is now. God reveals himself to us in our hearts as we worship him. David knew this all those years ago, before Jesus came. What was it that David prayed to God in Psalm 151? Well, he, he prayed this, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit. To sustain me. And as David, the psalmist here in, in Psalm 19 writes in verse 12, who can discern their own waywardness, the errors and the sin committed in their hearts? Only God can. And that's why with his next breath, David prays, forgive my hidden faults and flaws. You see, the temple of God is now in the heart of of man. That's where the business of God is done. Not in some temple complex made of stone. Christ's atoning sacrifice is for the cleansing of our hearts so that the Spirit of God can come in and reside there and empower us to live for the Father's glory day by day. Wherever you are, 
God is with you because he tabernacles in your heart. As David goes on to say, and I'm paraphrasing now, keep cleansing me, God, and keep me from my secret selfish sins. May they never rule over me, for only then will I be free from fault and remain innocent of rebellion. Jesus, the Lamb of God, came. He died so that we might live. He came to defeat sin and death which separates us from the Father and rose again that we might live for the glory of God. So that every word of our mouths and every meditation of our hearts might be pleasing and acceptable to and bring glory to the Father through Christ his Son, our Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Jesus answered them, and of course he was talking about his body, we're told, in the final verse there, in verse 21 of John 2. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. See, no longer does God dwell within a tabernacle or temple made by the hand of God. God dwells in the heart. That ancient sanctuary created by God himself long ago. Cleanse the heart. You cleanse the temple of God that the King of glory might come in. You see, judgment begins Revival begins with the people of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, have your way with us by your Spirit. Cleanse our hearts, we pray, as we open our hearts to you, to the searching eye of your Spirit. And Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name, who has made the way to you, who is the truth and who is the life. And so, Father, help us to move forward with you each day in the knowledge that we live for you and are empowered by you and by your Spirit who now dwells in our hearts. Father, forgive us our sins and draw us closer to you and so bring revival to our own hearts and as you bring revival to each one of our individual hearts Lord God you will bring revival to your church as we learn to love you with all our heart mind soul and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves for the glory of your precious name through Christ our Lord amen we're going to close our worship here today with a beautiful modern piece. I don't know whether you've heard it. You'll soon find out when it comes onto your screens. It's called Grave in the Gardens. And it's so relevant. The words of the, this worship piece are absolutely God-honoring and pleasing, I'm sure, to God. And praise God that God is raising up worship leaders and songwriters in these days as well to, bring, to help us step into the presence of God and bring glory to his holy name. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing 
My failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the mountain.